Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld. Welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. I'm delighted to have you join me today. Uh, I'm going to spend a number of weeks on the second chapter of the book of Ephesians, and it's a dynamite chapter for this reason. Listen, I can hardly think of an industry out there that makes more of before and after pictures, and that is the dieting industry. I mean, you know, we've all seen that man or woman before they got onto, you know, the prescribed diet, and this is what they looked like, and it wasn't good, and here they are a year later, and man, oh man, I mean, I mean, they're like the model, the ideal person that ought to step off a fashion magazine somewhere. And we look at that and we say, I, I wonder whether or not if I got on that same diet, the same results would be true in me. And, you know, the dieting industry does that for all the reasons that you might think they're basically appealing to desire, and you could look like this too. Well, the second chapter of Ephesians, in a sense, is like that, but it's different. It's different in this sense. It's not appealing to individuals and saying, this is what it would be like if you turned your life over to Christ. Rather, it's talking to people who are in Christ, and it's saying to them, remember what you used to be. Remember what your transformation actually looks like, and then ask yourselves this question, what is it that you have become? And so that's what Ephesians chapter 2 is all about, and I want to take some time very slowly working through this passage verse by verse to help believers understand the nature of our conversion. Listen, if you've truly come to know Christ as your Savior and Lord, if, if you've been born of the kingdom of God, if, if the Holy Spirit has created new life in you and you desire the things of God above all other things, you ought to take a look, take a step back, remember what you once were, now ask yourself what you've become. So that's Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, so bear with me, we're going to go through this one step at a time. I want to begin this study by making a statement about death. <laughs> there is nothing that you and I will ever face that is as hopeless as death. I mean, death is the, the great enemy of the human race, and, and death presents us, at least, you know, uh, without God, it presents us as the end of the journey in which nothing left will, is there to be accomplished. You're just over. And so it's a terrible enemy of the human race. I mean, death is a monster. I mean, many of you who are watching this have been at numerous funerals in your life. I mean, perhaps you've been at the funeral of, you know, a, a mom or a dad, or even a brother or a sister, some family member. I suppose the worst is that, you know, there's a parent, a mom or a dad, that stood at the graveside of a son or a daughter and wept as if there was nothing left in you to weep, uh, recognizing that this is all wrong, it should not have been this way. But if you can get those pictures, you'll get a picture of death. Now, when Paul begins to tell us the story of what it looked like before we were in Christ, that's the image he wants us to see. It is the image that starts in death. See, all experiences on this earth go from life to death. Every day we live, we know that we're one day closer to our own death, and death hunts us, and death will close in on us. But one day, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was himself invited to a funeral. He'd come late. His friend Lazarus had died several days before, and he was already buried in the tomb. The stone had been rolled over the tomb, and in the hot Middle Eastern climate without any embalming fluid, you know, the, the body would have begun to decompose, and so it was very important to seal off the tomb so that the odor of rotting flesh does not escape and that people who are gathered there to weep over the death of a loved one aren't breathing in the fumes of his own decay. That's the nature of death. But on that day when Jesus came to see his friend Lazarus, he asked you know, that great stone that sealed the tomb to be rolled away, and as he did, the, the odor of death shot through the door, and it must have been it, you know, it must have been overwhelming. People would no doubt have put handkerchiefs and anything, other piece of clothing over their face to simply, you know, not gag at that which they were smelling. And there in that place where death always claims its victims, where death always has the final word, Jesus contradicted the final word of death itself. He shouted out at his friend, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came, and there's a shuffling in the tomb, and as he came out, still wrapped in his grave clothes, as Jesus demanded that they unwrap him and let him go. 
That was the day that death died. That was the day that Jesus proclaimed that his word would have a word over death. And so, you know, you need to read the chapter. It's in John chapter 11, which describes it beautifully. But in the end of it, Jesus says as follows, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. See, that's the miracle of the gospel itself. That is, there is a word that is more profound than death. It is the word of Christ. And that's the beginning point. And so Paul, when he begins to explain our life before we had come to Christ, he wants to describe it with the finality that death invokes in us. We ought to read the words of the beginning, which says, and you were dead in sins and trespasses, and hear the word dead with all the images that it invokes in us. So that's the beginning of our story of our transformation. We need to come to terms with what we once were. So before I begin to read this text itself, which speaks about our life before Christ, you know, someone that might read this might say, this seems overwhelmingly negative. Are you actually saying that every single non-Christian is as bad as this description seems to entail that it is? And before I answer that, let me say that Ephesians chapter 2, we're about to read it, it is not the only word about what it means to be human. I mean, Genesis begins to tell us that every one of us were created in the image of God. Yes, we have fallen into sin, but the image of God actually remains. And so I want to say that the Bible has a great deal of positive things about what it means to be human, even apart from Christ. So let me give you a number of lists of what it means to be in the image of God. Because we're in the image of God, we have amazing capabilities and that we've inherited these capabilities from our Creator. Yes, they're intellectual abilities, but human beings, by virtue of the fact that we're in the image of God, look at things around us, not so much simply to see what they are, but we also look at things around us to look to see as to what they might be. I mean, this is one of the genius of being humans, is that we transform our environment. We may look at a bare piece of land, but in our mind's eye, we see a garden, or maybe we even see a building or a factory or something else that blesses the human race. I mean, we may look at our propensity to disease and the frailty of the human condition, and we may look at that and say, yes, but what is it? that makes our bodies so frail to viruses and all sorts of other things. And we might say, let's study that so that we might find a way to at least for a moment hold the diseases that have killed human beings in the past at bay. In other words, we look at problems that we see around us and we look to create a solution in the midst of it. See, that's a part of being in the image of God. That's a part of the the glory of what it means to be human. Not only do we create, not only do we have intellectual capacity, but we also have the capacity to know our Creator. I mean, I was just not long ago in the nation of Jordan, and uh, my wife and I, very early in the morning, uh, we were uh, right on a motel, right on the Dead Sea, and uh, we had we had gone down early in the morning to stand at the shore of the Dead Sea, and we were coming up a steep hill. And as we we're coming up a hill, there was a man. Uh, who was cleaning a pool in in that whole complex. And I had said good morning to him, and he had said good morning back, and then I had said something else, and then I realized, actually, good morning was the only English that he knew, and since I didn't know any Arabic, we were stymied. And then he looked at me and he said, morning, and then he pointed to heaven and he said, God. In other words, he said, yes, it's a morning, but it's been created by God, and we owe him thanks. And I thought to myself, that is profoundly a human statement. An individual can look at the dawning of a day quite unlike any other animal and say, but this day was made by my creator and I owe him an infinite debt of gratitude for what he's accomplished. See, that's a uniquely human thing to say. When we don't say those things, we deny our own humanity. It is a reflection of the glory of God. We were made to not only understand some things about God, but we were made to know him and to be intimate with him. So all of that is there in the Bible. And, you know, whether or not you know Christ personally or not, you are created with a capacity to know your creator. See, and it needs to be said before I begin to read. And so I want to say that every single passage in the scripture that speaks about our sin nature does not discount that every human being, regardless 
of your race, nationality, whatever you know, possibilities that you have in, you know, in your own life, whatever you are, um, you were made in the image of God. And yet, listen to what the passage of Scripture says. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, of all the positive things I've said up till now, did you notice that this sounds overwhelmingly negative? Because Even though we are created in the image of God, something has happened to us. We have become um, sinners. And here's the important part about all of this. Notice, first of all, I've read to you the first three verses of Ephesians chapter 2, but I want you to notice several things. First of all, Paul is writing this to believers. He's saying to believers, this is what you were before Christ lived in you and the Holy Spirit gave you a new heart to desire the things of God. It's an accurate description of what you once were. The second thing, I want you to notice also in what I've just read, the the personal pronouns that are here in this text. You, all of us, all of those kind of words. In other words, Paul is making this as personal as he can. He's not speaking to us you know, you know, wide, intellectual, far-off terminology, philosophical language about what is a potential reality. Rather, he's speaking about what we experienced before we are in Christ. So uh, please understand this is true, whether or not you converted at the age of five or whether you converted at the age of 85. It is true that before you came to know Christ, the description that Paul has given us here is an accurate description of what, ha- what we were like. So let's look again at what we were like. And you, speaking to Christians, were at one point in time dead in the trespasses and sins. Or let me just stop there. You were at one time dead. So we'll start with the word death. And please understand that death has, speaks of finality. I mean, were it not for the fact that Jesus had stood at the tomb of Lazarus, and then in the end, of course, that Jesus rose from his own tomb with eternal life, were it not for the fact that Jesus had demonstrated mastery over death, we would say, outside of Jesus, death is the final word. In other words, the final word of the human condition is that we are dead in sins. That is, we are irreversibly in sins. So let me say a couple of things. Death is permanent. You don't try death out for a short while and see if you like it. You you don't say, you know, death has, you know, death is not what I'm into because as you and I know, death has absolutely nothing to do with the human will. I mean, we might say to ourselves, I I don't want to die. I mean, I've known you know, elderly people who are on their deathbed who fight against death with all their might and others that simply, you know, give into it very quickly. But regardless, death always wins the day regardless of how the human will interacts with it. Some of you know Dylan Thomas, very interesting poem in which he writes, do not go gently into that good night. He writes, rage, rage against the dying of the light. In other words, fight with all your might against death that's approaching. Rage against it. But I'm going to say this to Dylan Thomas, whether you rage against it or simply go quietly into that good night, the night simply wins the day. That's what Paul wants to say. Listen, understand the nature of your life outside of Christ. You are dead in two things. You were dead in trespasses, says Paul, and you were dead in sin. So let's unpack that, shall we? I've said, first of all, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an irreversible condition. And then Paul says, look, there are two things, and uh, that we are dead in trespasses and sin. So let's look at, first of all, the word trespass. Now, the trespass can also be translated, it is in some Bibles, as transgression. And uh, to trespass, I mean, it's very easy to understand the word. If you've ever gone by a field somewhere or maybe a fenced-in compound somewhere and it's had a you know, big sign on it that says, no trespassing. 
And you know what trespassing is. There's a fence there. It says you may not lawfully enter into this ground. But when we said we're dead in trespasses, it means, look, sin is trespassing. It means that God has placed boundaries around human behavior, and the boundaries that he's placed are his holy laws. The law of God has been given. He said, you shall not have another God beside me. You shall honor the Sabbath day. Uh, You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. God gives law after law after law and says, this is the boundary. This is the fence. Don't go beyond that. And every single human being has gone beyond that. And by saying it's dead in trespasses, it's saying that we're irreversibly in trespasses. Let me see if I can give some examples of that. I've got before me an example from the Confessions of St. Augustine. If you don't know who St. Augustine was, uh, St. Augustine lived in the fifth century, and uh, he was most likely the greatest theologian in a thousand years. His confessions are really his confessions of his own sin before Christ redeemed him. And one of the confessions that he gives is as a 16-year-old boy, um, he and his friends came upon a pear tree and they picked the pears from the tree that were not theirs, and then they later threw them up against a wall laughing all the way as they had stolen the pears and now destroyed them. I mean, you know, there's a number of ways that one could look at that act. You can say, well, 16-year-old kids sometimes do, you know, crazy stuff, and this was a dumb thing that he did. Thankfully, he grew out of that and became a decent human being. And so your life goes on. It's not a big deal. But, but here's what Augustine wrote about this. He said, those pears were beautiful. But it was not they for which my miserable soul lusted. I had better ones available, but I gathered those simply in order to steal. For once gathered, I threw them away, eating from them wickedness alone, which I gladly enjoyed. You see how he's describing that? In fact, as he goes on, he wants to say that destroying those pairs was destroying the creation that God had made, and it was his act of anger and hatred against his own creator that, you know, that egged him on to act in this way. By saying that we're dead in trespasses is to say that our that our propensity to constantly disobey the law of God is so innate in every fallen human being that there's no way out of this rebellion. It carries on. It's an irreversible condition that every time we find a law of God, it just knocks us out to simply, you know, to to trespass over that line and do that which God has said you must not do. It's irreversible. There's no way out. You can't say to yourself, oh, I don't want to be this way anymore. You see, uh, this is one of the the problems with the moral reform movement. You know, some of us, when we... uh when we uh, sin, we say, well, I, I don't know what led me to do that. I, I, I shouldn't do that again. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to take better action next time. It was a bad mistake. I shouldn't have made it. I'm sorry about that. I'll do better next time. That's exactly the opposite of what this text says. The text says there is no moral reform out of this. You're dead in this activity. This is how you always were. See, here's the thing. Uh, Not only does the Bible say we're dead in trespasses, but it says we're also dead in sin. So if trespasses are, you know, God gives a law and says, don't do this and we do it, sin basically means that we failed to miss the mark. In other words, God says, but I want you to do this, but we haven't. So whether God has forbidden a behavior from us or God has commanded us into a behavior, either way, we simply will not listen and we will carry on. And here's the thing about the law of God. It is, if you will, an objective diagnostic tool. You know, when you go to a doctor and, uh, you know, there's something wrong with you and the doctor gives you a number of diagnostic tests and finally comes back and says, I got bad news, you know, it's cancer, you know, that persistent cough that you've had is actually throat cancer, and suddenly we wake up and say, oh, I now have a name for that which I'm doing, and that's what the law essentially is. You know, I'll give you some examples. We might say, you know, I just, you know, appreciate a beautiful woman, uh, and I playfully flirt with her at the office, but God comes along and says, it's called adultery in the heart. Or we might say to ourselves, you know, I just took a couple of things home from work, Uh, They'll never miss it, and besides, I need that, and God says it's called theft. 
You see, every behavior that we have which violates the law of God, God puts a name on it. He puts a diagnosis on the behavior and says, this is who you are. Now, I'm trying to paint this as badly as I can, and so I want to notice a couple of things from verse 1. Again, notice we are dead in trespasses, in sins, and then it says in verse 2, in which you once walked. In other words, you know, if you watch some of those, you know, Night of the Walking Dead movies, you know, they, people are walking along in death. Um, they are, you know, they, they are already zombies and, you know, just carry on. In a sense, that's what our sin does to us. We are unresponsive to the ways of God. We don't listen to his word. We listen to our own heart. We follow that. And there is no hope for us whatsoever. Let me say it again. You know, for all those people that'll say things like, ah, you know, I, 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 I could turn to Christ any time I wanted to, this passage belies that. You're not capable of that. You're dead in your sins, and you'll continue in death unless Christ speaks life to the dead. Uh, that's the term behind it. Now, let's keep following it because there's more to learn. And in verse 2 we read, in which you once walked following, watch this, the course of this world. Now, Paul will say there are three places where death, this dead in sin, actually works in you. And the first is that you're following the course of this world. Now, whenever the Bible uses the word world, most often it speaks about the values that our culture accepts. You know, I always laugh about this because uh, we have all sorts of individuals who love to proclaim themselves self-made men or self-made women. I don't accept the values around me. I You know, I make my own values, I define myself. I mean, all of that, you know, is a pack of lies and we're lying to ourselves when we say it. Here's some easy examples. Why is it that if you were born in Canada, as I am, why is it that you speak the English language? And the answer is, well, because everyone in my culture spoke that language and I therefore imitated what I heard around me and I did the same thing. Well, it's not only true in language, it's true in dress and in customs, the way we greet one another, and all sorts of things that we think to be quite normal. Each one of these were taught to us by the world, which means by the culture in which we lived. And so the culture constantly forces us into certain behavioral patterns. I I sometimes find it fascinating that, you know, people who are, for instance, in the Hell's Angels, and who say, you know, we don't accept the values of our culture. I mean, we're kind of self-made, we're going our own way, and, you know, we're rebelling against every cultural value. I find it fascinating that all those people who talk that way, they all wear the same boots, they all wear the same pants, they all have the same hair and the same beard and the same pot, you know, on the gut on the front, and they all ride exactly the same motorcycle. In other words, they are conformists down to a T. In fact, we all are conformists, and that's the point I'm trying to make. There is that we are dead to the principles of this world. You know, it teaches us that the world itself provides for us, our culture provides for us a series of values that every single person adopts without even thinking about it. Um, Again, I find this fascinating because using my example, which I just did, of coming up in Jordan, you know, um, back to the hotel and going by the pool guy, and immediately he gave thanks to God for the day. That's because he lives in a culture in which his culture teaches him to do that, to speak about God constantly. Uh, In uh, most Western countries, the talk about God is abnormal. I mean, God talk doesn't happen. We talk about, you know, whether our sports teams, we talk about how we hate the politicians that we have. I mean, we have a list of topics that are very acceptable in our culture, but speaking about God, his mercy, and about his love for us, and the creation of every single day, and our obligation to give thanks, that seems unnatural to us because the culture that we lived in shaped and formed us to be precisely as we are. And here's the point that I'm trying to make. The cultures that we live in are also, not just we who are dead in sins, but the cultures that we live in are also dead in sins. They are all teaching us values opposed to the values of Christ. And if you don't know it, chances are you've so deeply adopted those values that you're unaware of the fact that you have. And here's what Paul is saying. Before you came to Christ, the culture, 
told you how to live. You were dead in that. Now notice, let's continue to read. It says, not only were you following the course of this world, and here I'm reading uh, in in verse uh, 2, but also following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived. See, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. I mean, the Bible always defines that not only is the culture around us, the world, a subverting influence, but so also is a real being whose name is Satan, also called the devil, the diabolical one, who leads the whole world astray. You know, in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus attributed to Satan two essential attributes. He says he was a liar from the beginning and he is also a murderer from the beginning. In other words, what the devil does is he causes us to discount the value of human life, that's murder, but also to lie, to manipulate the truth, and to do anything that we need to make ourselves look good, even if it means that we deceive everyone else around us. See, the, Jesus said that, that Satan is the father of lying. And I'll say something, psychologists have sometimes done studies about people's propensity to lie. And a fascinating thing about all of this is that every single human being lies multiple times every single day. We are people of the lie, and people of the lie are people who are sold to evil. The difference between lying and truth-telling is the difference between wickedness and righteousness. I mean, I know we discount our white lies, but they are lies nonetheless, and they make us what we truly are, people of wickedness. Now, th- there's a third area in here. I've talked about you know, the, the influence of culture, the influence of Satan himself. And then notice verse 3, among whom we all once lived. This is the culture in which we lived. And then it says, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And, and here we have this third influence. We've talked about the influence of, of the, the world, the devil, and here we talk about the flesh which is an inward propensity to do wickedness. And um, I I remember uh, a number of years ago, and this will date me, but it was all the way back in 1989 when psychologist, Christian psychologist, uh, Dr. James Dobson, uh, did an interesting interview with a guy by the name of Ted Bundy on the very day in which Ted was executed. Uh, Ted Bundy had been a mass serial murderer and had murdered one woman after another. And here was this final interview with a Christian psychologist. And as James Dobson was leading this serial murderer through his life, um, Bundy told about the first time he had ever murdered someone and he felt absolutely overwhelmingly uh, that he would never do this again. He was sickened by what he had himself done until the urge rose within him again and he murdered his second person telling himself, this is the end, I'll never do that again until the repetitive you know, pattern of these murders came to the point where they no longer, no longer bothered his conscience at all. And that is the flesh. It is the repetitive patterns of wickedness until they no longer bother us, but they lead us astray. In other words, our minds may say, don't do it, but our flesh says, keep on doing it, and the flesh wins the day. Now notice this, the world, the devil, the flesh, and we are dead in these, locked in this, and there is no way out. You don't stand at the coffin of a dead man and make the case to the dead man that death has its disadvantages and life has its advantages, so wouldn't you want to choose life? The dead man is unresponsive to any pleas because he's locked into death, and that's exactly what Paul is describing here. And that brings us right to the end of verse 3, and and with this we're going to end, because verse 3 says, we were by nature the children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. See, some people don't want to kind of drink this in. I have a story to tell, and that is a number of years ago, um, I had a conversation with an individual who was, he had a dear family member that was dying. And uh, I knew this dear family member, and uh, I said to the individual that I knew, I said, have you had a chance you know, to go over his dead bedside and just share the gospel with him? 
and he said, well, here's what I actually did. I said, you know what's going to happen to you after you die? And he said, no problem, I'm going to heaven. So my friend said to me, I think it's going to be okay. And I responded to him and said, did you know that in North America today, there are more people that believe they're going to heaven than actually believe that there is a God? Everybody thinks they're going to heaven. We discount our own sin. We discount our own wickedness. We make little of our sins and much of the sins of others. We simply speak to ourselves in well-meaning words. It's said that even in prisons where individuals are murderers, they'll say, yeah, but deep down, I'm a good person. And it was just a one-off, you see. We all have multiple ways of saying, I'm going to be fine in the end of the day. But the law of God says you're not going to be fine. The law of God says that in the end of the day, you are an object of wrath. And when you hear the wrath of God, please don't think that this means that, you know, God just gets, you know, furious and and, and flies off the handle. Rather, the wrath of God means that God will mete out justice as justice deserves. He will look at every single infraction of the law of God and he will judge us accordingly. And the Bible says that in the end of the day, not one person will stand our most Righteous deeds are as filthy rags before God. Everyone is guilty of sin, and we will be found having fallen short of the glory of God in the final day. We are dead in this process, and there's no way out. You see, here's the wonderful news of the gospel of Jesus. Everyone who says yes to Christ is exactly as Lazarus once was. We were dead, and Jesus stood at the door of our tomb, and his loud voice spoke out, whatever your name is, Bill, Mary, whatever your name is, and he shouted to you, come forth. And it is because Christ spoke to you that you stepped out of that tomb. So please understand this before and after picture, because that's what I've been trying to paint for you. If you want to gain a sense, if you know Christ as your personal Savior, if you want to gain a sense of how precious it is to be saved, Read Ephesians chapter 2 and revel again in the fact, I was unable to respond to God, but God had mercy on me. That's the good news of the gospel. And hear me, if today you've never known Christ as Savior and Lord, if you've never turned from yourself, turned from the world, turned from your sin, and turned from Satan's influence, if you simply drifted along, but today, you're hearing these words and your soul is being arrested, understand this, this is Christ calling to you. And it's time for you to renounce your sinfulness and thank God that he sent his Holy Spirit to awaken you of your soul's danger and to turn to him. Well, we're going to carry on in this series. And as we do, we're going to talk about what it means for Christ to save us. It is a most spectacular thing. Please, Whenever you're telling the story of your salvation, don't tell it in terms of I made a good decision because you didn't. You were dead. That's the truth of the Word of God. Thanks for being a part of Back to the Bible today. Always delighted when you can join me. Thanks for taking the effort and the time to spend the time in the Word of God. The Lord bless you. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, Thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.